Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. And he turned to me and he says, well, what do you know? You shouldn't even be in this country. You should get back to your own country. And I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. That nastiness in that split second shows your true colors. That shows you what you truly think of me and my position here. And I was like, I thought to myself, wait a minute. This was literally just a joke because we were all joking. And I thought that was not a joke. You see, you weren't adding on to the joke. You've made that personal. And that is just, for me, I just thought, I just felt so isolated in this job. What physiological responses did you go through? What did you lose within yourself? What, what affected your mind and your body and your soul? I think one of the main things we're talking about core values right from the get go. And one of mine self-belief. It dented my self-belief. I still had, I was still able to have confidence in myself, yes, but it dented it. And I would maybe then be quiet. I'd be quieter around the, the peace table in, in the, the canteen. I would be more inward in myself. It made me then not want to come to work. The anxiety increased. I was throwing up before work because I was so anxious, not only because I didn't like the job, but because the culture that exists, I was like, wait a minute, I didn't want to be around these people. I didn't want to be around these people because of how they made me feel. Like, I will, and I will say this, not all of them were like this. I, I met really very good people there too. And some people were, were amazing people and somebody who's still my friend to this day. But the majority of them, unfortunately, weren't. And that Macho Boys Club made me feel so isolated in myself that I didn't want to share anything with them. I remember I, you know, I had have this dog called Louie. And he's a little fluffy white dog. And he's not the most manly of dogs of what we define what manly is. And they would all make fun of me because I'd be like, oh, look at Louis's picture. And they'd be like, oh, it's that. you can't even call that a dog. And I'm like, hold on a second. You know, they, I mean, my relationship with Louis and what Louis gave me was more than any of them put together. And when they started yeah. slagging off Louis and how it was not a macho dog, you can't call that a dog and things like that. I just thought, well, hold on a second, this is just, yet again, this is targeted at me because somebody would then show a picture of their dog and it was a pug, so a small dog, and they'd be like, oh, yes, look at that dog, and they'd look at it in a positive light, and I was like, wait a minute, this is me? This is just me because I'm an easy target. And I became so resentful. And when we have that resentfulness, when we have that anger in us, that has physical impacts. I lost two stone in weight because of this stress, because this resentfulness, because that anxiety. No wonder I was just throwing up everything. I didn't want to eat and I wasn't eating. I was skipping meals and I was I was depressed. It, made, it brought me down to a, a, a bad period of my life where I just wanted to sleep. I didn't want to do anything else. It was difficult. It was very difficult and all because, yes, the job was difficult, but all because of other people too. Which is sad. Yeah. Did you ever hit? Did you ever hit a red line? Did you ever react? Do you ever explode? I didn't. If I'm honest with you, where surprise, I you never didn't. wanted. I know. I I never. I was. I was always very calm. I am a calm person. I never wanted to give them that power, so to speak. I never wanted to give them that. Oh, we've we've cracked him, because. I always never wanted to show my, I don't know, I never wanted to show what was underneath the surface because I didn't want to give them the satisfaction. I didn't want to give them the satisfaction that I was sad about what they were doing, that I was angry or whatever. So I just kind of kept going with it. And I am a very private person anyway. But when I'm with people who I feel like I cannot trust, I will become a lot more private. And I just became hardened to where it was impacting me, yes. But on the surface, I wouldn't give them the satisfaction to know it, which is, it's, it's sad that I kept it and I didn't react to people who were actually doing the damage. 
Which, which yeah. Was it um, when all this was happening, if somebody had walked in, would they have stopped or would they have carried on? So what meaning was it like a public, was it always public? Was there witnesses to it? Whether the, the they were on that? The, so yeah, the, no, the problem is it, it, in private, they would be my best friends. Public, it was public humiliation. It was in public where they got their kicks and I would have a good relationship with them in private. We were in the, the police cars together and we could talk and things like that. And then when we'd get around people, they would make me the butt of the joke. They'd be like, oh, Rob did this. I'm like, wait a minute, this was, this was us two in the car. You know, this wasn't going to go any further. And they just made me the joke so that everybody else was laughing and they would be seen as making a joke and making everybody else laugh. And that public humiliation is hard. It's hard to accept when one person's treating you nicely one minute and then the next minute. Well, not one person ever said to me privately, you should get back to your own country. Publicly, they said it repeatedly. Yeah. And I suppose that's where our story does differ because they would be nice to me in front of everybody, but okay. fucking horrible to me when no one's around. And I'd be like, okay. I'd look around and go, did nobody just see that? So then oh. I, then I started to doubt myself. Like mm, it is me, it is me. Yeah. That isn't happening because nobody else has seen it. So therefore, it is me. And um, I later, I think maybe a year later after it all came out, I'd heard this word gaslighting. Never heard of <laughs> gaslighting before in my life. No. I didn't even know bullying existed to adults before that point. I just, yeah. we worked in schools, so I just I thought it happened to the kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not justifying that that's right, but yeah. Um, I could be here all day, but the throwing about my journey, but I did, I did lash out. I did, I did, I did, I did blow up, but I blew up because I knew my senior manager, uh, my senior principal um, had hugged me that day and said, and I didn't know this, but he hugged me in the staff room and said, I know what's going on at my school, keep your head up. But I didn't know he knew that. I, I'd never gone to him, or maybe I did, I can't remember, but somehow he knew, and I don't know how, and it just made me go a little bit, you know? And that day, she went for me again, in in public, but but probably a normal way somebody would if they were in public, if you know what I mean? And, yeah. um, and I lost it, yeah. I totally lost it. I obviously didn't hit anybody, but I turned around and hit, smacked a table and just collapsed to the ground and oh, everything just came out. But I think subconsciously I did that because I knew somebody knew. Yeah. Whereas before, I'd have looked like the mental case. Yeah. Do you know That's, what I mean? Yeah, I completely agree. And I remember my sergeant actually pulled me in once and he said, by the way, I saw that this individual was saying about, you know, get back to your own country. I think I think he's just joking. He just takes it too far sometimes. So again, and those two were like best friends for like 30 years. Hmm. So he was kind of maybe defending him to an extent. And I, I got on well with this individual and that's what hurt me the most. Because like, I got on well with you. And in public, you want to make jokes of me. Yeah, and that's yeah it was so it was so sad and so my sergeant pulled me in and said that to me and then i remember a few weeks later i you know with my sergeant we were able we were close and we were able to make jokes of each other and it was always on that level where we were all laughing with each other and we were laughing together and then i said something about him and he laughed and then he said but what do you know uh, you're you're from Northern Ireland. You should just get back to your own country. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa! You're the one who just pulled me in to say that he should he shouldn't be saying it. But I don't think it's coming from a a, a place. But he shouldn't be saying it. And I've told him maybe cut that down a little bit. And then for him then to react in a certain way to then say that to me too when he <laughs> knew it, I was like, doesn't what? make any sense, does it? it? No. And that's where you just think. You, you all just didn't care. You just, it's, you just wanted, I said, just that quick laugh. You always wanted just to make sure that everybody else was in your pocket and make sure that everybody else was laughing with you. And you did not care. You did not care who you were laughing at. And that was a prime example where no matter what, you picked something there to laugh at me with rather than with me. 
what I've, I'm sure you you feel the same, but what I've come to learn is the, they're really just all insecure and oh, of course. they're filling a bucket. They're filling themselves up by hurting somebody else, you know? Oh, of course. If they were to watch this episode and you wanted to say something, what would you say to them now? <laughs> yeah, if I, if I did that a couple of years ago, I'd pull you some more swear words. But sure. I would say now, look inwards. Look inward within yourself. You've just hit the nail on the head there to say they're insecure people. I'd say do the work. Do the work that you need to do. Sort out your own traumas and don't ever dare put your traumas onto other people because your behavior impacts people. Whether you think it or not, it impacts people. So have more responsibility when you speak to people. Have more responsibility when you talk to people and make jokes with people because you can damage people so much with just a word. So don't ever take that responsibility lightly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I love it. I probably would say the exact same thing. Yeah. Minus the few swear words yeah. I probably wouldn't have <laughs> a few years ago too. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely learn to cut them out with some of the stuff. Because I said, I'm so angry. So yeah. angry and resentful to the police and the people in it that, yeah, I probably couldn't have spoke even about the police service in general without saying something negative and throwing in a few swear words because I felt like just the, everybody let me down. They let yeah. me down. And it's taken a process to understand that that anger only impacted me, not them. They don't care. So yeah. I need to let it go and, yeah, change my change my mindset towards it. Yeah. And that is your journey and that is your experience and you're just speaking openly about it. If it gives you anything, though, my best mate is in the police force and um, he um, – he 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 does love his job and he thankfully isn't going through uh, what you went through and i i, I don't yeah I, he he does enjoy his job but he's obviously very tired and very and he, he goes through the trauma and stuff and deals with a lot of accidents and stuff he's in that side of things um but he he um yeah he enjoys his work so hopefully it's not everywhere in the police no. force hopefully i don't i don't think so i'm think i i know that there will be many police services like this yes but there was, there will be uh, many that are actually doing the right things and yeah. cutting out these bad apples. Yeah. Um, but the problem is with this, my experience was that the the barrel was rotten to the core, and there was too many bad apples in it. So yeah. it's a work in progress. But I think, yeah, we the um... long way to go. <laughs> yeah, and it's the same in teaching, right? You know, and I'm sure it's the same in medical and nurses and hospitals and so on. All these hierarchies are, you know, people look down at people and people look to the side and treat them like shit and whatnot. It'll be the same in every industry, in in in, in, in particular in teaching. I see it all the time, and that's why I've taken control uh, be, by becoming a casual teacher, not only to fulfil my purpose with the podcast, but to take away the power of everybody else. I have the power. I know people look down yeah. at casual teachers, um, but I'm Superman. I, I go in every day and I'm Superman. It's that simple. And I have no stress and I see them all being stressed and I, I know I've made the right decision for me. Um, anyway, moving on, what did you do to get out of that situation then? And did you move away? What did, what, how did you take control of that? To be honest with you, the, the situation took control of me before I was able to take control of it. It led to me, not just the bullying, that was just part of it, but just living this unhappy life and one full of trauma really impacted my mental health. And, you know, I would, I would put my head down to the pillow each night and I would just think of the traumas of the day, think of the things I'd witnessed, think to myself, could I have done something different to save someone's life? And when you think like that, it's a, it's a sure far away, away to poor mental health because you cannot doubt yourself. You cannot think about what if, but what if, especially in that line of work. So I was driving myself crazy with these kind of things, but I couldn't get the traumas out of my head. And it's just, you know, I always talk about this idea of work-life balance. And for me, it doesn't exist. It's just life balance, especially in a job like that, where the traumas came with me. Of course it does. I, when I took that uniform off, the traumas didn't go with the uniform. It came with me. The stresses came with me. And when you are making decisions that are literally life and death, 
there's a lot more onus on those decisions. And therefore, you, you think about them a lot longer. You can't not. You're only human. So I was in this spiral of negativity, stress, bad stress and trauma. And I was just, I was just fed up of living my life. I did see a light at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that light at the end of the tunnel was to no longer be here. That light at the end of the tunnel was to take my own life. And I look back now and I think to myself, Rob, you were really in a position in your life where a light, a shining light was to no longer be here. And that's so sad because I realized that it wasn't that I hated life. It was just that I hated my life and the way it looked. And there's a big difference there. But at that time, it didn't come to that conclusion. I just thought life and that was it. Because I felt so trapped. Trapped in this life of the job. Trapped in this life of the bullying. Trapped in this life of unhappiness. When you feel trapped, you make decisions to try to get untrapped. But those decisions weren't possible to me on, on apart from the one taking my own life. So it was a difficult time that time. And I remember a day in July 2018 when it all just came too much. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is the day. And I, I woke up about 3 p.m. having slept all day, which was just normal. And I thought, this is, I'm going to take my life today. And I walked down the hall to go downstairs, to go to the garage. As I walked down the hall, I was met by my dog, Louie. That fluffy thing that was getting a butt of people's jokes. And Louie looked up at me with the big brown eyes that he's got, and he gave me one big lick. And it was that lick that just snapped me out of it. It was that lick that saved my life because Louis showed me in that split second that somebody needed me. Now, I didn't think, I didn't care about anybody else. I didn't care about the people I was leaving behind. I didn't care about my family. I didn't care what they would think. I didn't care about my friends, colleagues. I didn't care. But it was not that I didn't care. It was just that I didn't think. They just weren't in my, in my mind. All I wanted was the pain to stop. All I wanted was this to end. But Louis showed me on that day that somebody needs me and Louis and I did everything together. And without my love and attention, how can Louis live the happy life that he lives? And I thought, I can't do this to you. Couldn't do it to you, not my family, not my friend. I couldn't do it to Louis. And we embraced and he kept licking me. And I just knew at that time I wasn't going to take my own life and I was going to live for him. And I'm not afraid to say that today I'm here talking to you because of that lick and because of Louis. I'm literally here because of Louis. Your dog saved your life. Quite literally, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. That's absolutely beautiful. If if Louis didn't come out of the room or what, you know, what came in front of your footsteps, would he have come into your mind? No, I don't think he would have. Just the same way as my family wasn't coming to, to my mind. Mm -hmm. I think when you make that decision, you, you're blinded by that decision and you only think about that. So my mind only thought of this process of that's it. I'm just going to take my own life. The pain's going to stop. So there was no room for anything else. I was so set on my on my ultimate goal, so to speak, awful yeah. goal to have, but it was at the time. Did you know when you went to sleep the night before that the next day was going to be the day? I didn't actually. I didn't. I knew. I was so fed up of life I knew that I had thoughts about taking my own life I knew that it was an option but on that day something was obviously in me when I woke up that I just knew this is it this is the day 
And it's funny, I can't ever explain why that came to my mind on that day. It's not like something happened and I was like, this is it. It was a reactive thing. It wasn't like that. It was just that I woke up and thought, I don't know, I felt peace. I felt peace with the decision. And it just took a, a night's sleep. I said, waking up at 3 p.m. And just thought, nah, this is, this, this is going to stop. So uh, did you know how you were going to do it? Yeah, I was going to hang myself in the garage. And it's funny, not I say it's funny, it's not funny, but funny that a few months before that, I had cut down, uh, somebody had hung themselves in their garage. And, uh, you know, I cut him down and he was on my on my arm and I, I, as they rested him onto the ground. His wife was in tears. He was completely distraught. His 14-year-old son came in. Yeah. It was horrible. But I'm not saying that gave me the, the plan. But it was just strange that there was a, a synergy to the hanging that I had dealt with and the, the potential hanging of myself. This this really paints the picture of where your mind had gone, though, because most other people haven't seen somebody who'd mm. commit suicide, let alone pull that person down. Mm. So not only had you seen somebody hang themselves, and I didn't know that before this episode, mm. but not only did you pull, you'd seen them hanging, mm. you'd seen a dead person, you'd seen the result of that, which I'm sure you saw many other dead people, mm. but on this one scenario, but you saw the effects on their wife and the 14 year old son. Yet that didn't stop you going to do it. That just yeah. shows you how depth where your mind had gone into darkness, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. I've not even thought of it like that myself that, and I've, you know, I've seen the impacts of it, but that, mm -hmm. that day, especially, you know, I saw the, the hanging and the impacts of it too. And yeah, it still wasn't enough for me to understand the the seriousness of doing it and the yeah the repercussions. So interesting. You've got me thinking now too, but it's interesting that it didn't wasn't in my mind, wasn't present in my mind when it should have been. It well, just again, shows you. Yeah, it does. It shows you where the mind can go, can't it? Um yeah. I mean I've never seen anything like that myself. Um, so, and I, I, I was not at the stage of going to do it, uh, but in the last two years, I've openly admitted to people that I had the thoughts. Did I plan it? No. Did I go to do it? No. But I definitely had the thoughts of maybe it's easier and I can get rid of it and I pick other people better off. And it's not even the people that was close to me. It's more like, I suppose, the people who were doing it, I guess. I don't know. It was crazy stages i i don't know but yeah no nowhere near to the depth of yours that's for sure and and i know there's no ranking on trauma which one of my other guests once said to me but um yeah that's i, I liked how you you said that earlier about you, you were taking i forgot how you said it now but how you took your um the situation took you out of it you didn't take yourself out of the situation or at least it was going to that was powerful um your story doesn't end there, though, does it? Well, actually, no, before we do go on to the next stage, Louis, I've got Louis in my head. After you, he's licked you and you've decided you're not going to do it, what does the rest of the day look like for you on that day? You know? Yeah, I, I went back to bed and me and Louis cuddled. And, oh. you know, Louis, Louis was always by my side in my darkest days he would join me in bed and he always loved being the the little spoon and he'd always get spooned and we'd just cuddle and I'd hold him and he was just there you know what dogs are like they, they're so uh, they're so clever and understanding of when their owner's going through difficult times and Louis is the only person at the time who I would know because I didn't share it with anybody I didn't tell my parents until last year that I, I, really? I was going to do this. And that was back in 2018. 
So I showed, it just shows you how much I held in, I held in everything. And Louis was the only one who knew my deepest, darkest secrets, so to speak. It, he was the only one and he never judged me for them. He was there with me and that was a big thing for me to have. Yeah. Well, you've met my floss um, yes. online, <laughs> so I, I, I totally get it. I, I'm she, she was there for me through my time, so I totally relate to everything you've just said there. When you told your, your mum, what did she say? They were upset. They were very upset that I'd been down that road without opening up to them and reaching out to them as any parent would ever feel like when you say that you're about to take your own life and you didn't think about the repercussions. They're going to be, there's going to be a little bit of anger. There's going to be a lot of upset. And there was definitely that upset there where they just, I don't know, they, I think they just, they wish that I never went through it, yes. And they wish that they were there to help me. And there's the helplessness knowing that they weren't there and they didn't know. So that was difficult for them to probably to comprehend and to understand. And like any parent would probably have to comprehend that he's been dealing with this for, well, this was what, five years ago and we didn't know. Yeah. Never mind how long it was before he wanted to take his own life, that he was struggling. Yeah. So that's a difficult thing for any parent. I'm sure I, I'm not a parent, but for any parent, you can give me the advice there. But if you if you were told that there's a there's a definite helplessness there with you thinking they went through all that and I didn't have a clue. It's it's sad. It's very sad. I am a parent, but I don't know how to even prepare for that, mate. So I, I honestly yeah. can't answer it. I, I really yeah. don't. I don't think any yeah. parent would ever mentally prepare for that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's, it, it's heartbreaking. My, my mum knew that I was sad because I remember she visited me once and I was talking to her and she said, Rob, you're not happy. I was like, what do you mean? Like, I, of course I am. Of course I'm happy. Yeah. And she was like, no, no, no. She's like, there's something wrong. There's, you're not yourself. There's, you're not happy. And I wasn't happy. So she mom knew deep you. down, but I just didn't have the, the, the gumption to to tell her I knew what mums are like anyway the mums know everything you can't ever hide anything from them but yeah she knew and she knew my emotions anyway she, my mum has always been like that with me um, she will know when I'm down and we've just got that connection and she, it must be even more difficult when she knew that she she knew that she knew but I still I had to be the one to open up and I didn't yeah and that's the pose the journey you're on now is the power of opening up, right? When you're talking yeah. about suicide prevention, especially this month, we're filming in the month of September yeah. today for everybody. It's, you know, 12th of September in the month of uh, suicide prevention. Yeah. Um, and I know this won't be aired in September, but it, I suppose it's perfect timing to have you here, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, definitely. If I was listening to this, I'd be um, wondering about Louis. Yeah. Where's he's, Louis now? He's... He's still here. He's still oh, here good. and still <laughs> living a, a happy life that he gets spoiled day in, day out. And yeah, he's just, you know, we all say that our dogs are the best dogs and dogs are just, they are amazing on our pets in general. And we all have a unique connection with each and every one of our pets. And I've had many pets in my life, but nothing's come close to the connection Louis had because when you've got a dog that's literally saved your life, it's very hard not to have that connection like no other, you know, no other pet that I've had. So oh, he's still he's still shining bright and being the loving dog that he is and he gets all the love in the world. How old, how old is uh, Louis now? He just turned eight. So he oh, did cool. and he, he just had an operation uh, last week and I was... I was in bits, so I was like so nervous oh. and upset, just making sure he was going to come out of it okay. But he he, he did, and he's he's fighting fit. So oh, yeah, he's can good. I ask what the operation was on? It was just a dental. He had to get a lot of his teeth out because there was a lot of decay and stuff in his okay. teeth. That, um, but we had a bad experience with um with our last dog, with our family dog, growing up, where he didn't respond well to the to the anesthetic anesthesia and never never 
was the same dog after that and he got put down six months after so we had that bad experience and it's always traumatized me ever since and so yeah i can't i don't know he's you know he's a fit dog but eight and he's also now he's got a little heart murmur because that those the breeds of dogs do have heart murmurs so there's just a little bit more risk there and near my own trauma so it was a yeah. stressful time, but he's pulled through, thankfully. Well, we can understand why you you would naturally be paranoid or worried about that for sure. Yeah. Um, back to your journey in the in the in the in the police. Um, you were still in the police. This was July. We're at July two thousand eighteen. Um, yep. when Louis saved your life. Um, but you stayed in the police for a little bit longer. Um, until something else drastically happened on your journey. But let's fill that gap before we get to that. What did the you've just you've just decided not to commit suicide how does that next few months look being at work because I, I mean i know i remember my journey and fuck you know um anxiety paranoia all that stuff started to flood out of my yeah. i can't i can't imagine coming from that yeah it was you know the, the anxiety was still there the paranoia probably was worse paranoia in these kind of situations and you'll understand the paranoia is it drives you crazy. It yeah. really does. And I've, like I've, I've since been diagnosed with PTSD from my experiences in the police. And paranoia is always that one thing that creeps its head up, even in the, my recovery after the police. It's a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Paranoia. I would not wish that upon somebody who I didn't like. Like anybody, I wouldn't wish paranoia on because it, it brings you into deep, dark places too. And the paranoia when I was a police officer was was bad. It was tough. So it it just kept going. I lost two stone in weight, but I kept I kept showing up at work. I wow. put a smile on my face. I would check in with people. I'd say, by the way, if, if you need anything, I'm here to talk. Or we'd see a traumatic thing, and I'd say, by the way, if you need to talk, I'm here for you. So I wore a mask every single day and then I'd go home and then sleep and sleep more and sleep some more. I wasn't living any form of life. And that yet again, that takes its toll on you where I was just, you know, I was there for everybody else. Nobody could ever see that I was struggling. There's no open communication, but I wanted to make sure that everybody else knew that they could openly communicate with me. So a couple more years went by and well, a year and a bit went by until my last ever shifts now. I didn't realize it was going to be my last shift until it transpired that it was. And the last shift just changed everything. Now, people would say that me wanting to take my own life and saving and my dog save me was the awakening I needed. But something inside me, it wasn't. But this last shift was that awakening. It was something that has made me who I am today. Let's put it that way. So, the last shift. The what last happened. Shift. I, I, I mean, for me, this these are iconic words, and this is kind of I've been playing around with this since you told me. But the last shift. What was the last shift for you? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.